Protesters gather on the Nipigon River Bridge, upset over the treatment of Indigenous remains found in the area. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Red Rock Indian Band held a peaceful demonstration on Highway 1117 at the Nipigon Bridge this morning. Chief Alan Odawa was joined by about 100 supporters speaking out against what they call repeated indignities to ancestral remains at the original site for a Parks Canada Visitor Centre in Nipigon. Jessica Clement reports. Red Rock Indian Band, along with various other First Nations, walked to the Nipigon Bridge Monday morning in protest of what they consider repeated disrespect towards ancestral remains found at the former site of Parks Canada's Visitor Centre in Nipigon. During excavation for the planned National Marine Conservation Area Visitor Center, the remains of four indigenous ancestors were uncovered. However, they were incomplete due to how much earth had been removed from the site, with around 60 loads of earth still unaccounted for. Chief Alan Odawa Jr. says it's sad that I had to come to a peaceful demonstration to make their voices heard. During May 8th, uh, Parks Canada was uh, digging a hole in, un unearthed some of our ancestors, and I just the red tape and gray areas, we just couldn't get anything back. It was a very frustrating because you shouldn't have to go to, to this extreme to, to get any answers. Parks Canada has issued a statement saying, though it is beyond our jurisdiction, Parks Canada has advocated for the return of materials from private properties and continues to work with landowners and government departments to locate and return all ancestral remains. We sincerely recognize the pain this unfortunate situation has caused. The protesters ended up blocking the north side of the bridge, slowing down highway traffic to handle informational pamphlets. Through this protest, Odawa is hoping Parks Canada will recognize its mistakes and they'll be able to make meaningful change moving forward. With the burial investigation, they had to wait for the material to get off federal land before they can step in. So it's just that long process. So hopefully what we get out of this is that this never happens again, that the burial units is involved right from, it doesn't matter if it's on federal or provincial land, the burial should have been, been involved right away. This is a historical moment to find remains that date back down to the 1400s. This is something that you write a book about, you know, this is uh, pretty big. And the lack of uh, the lack of movement and the lack of respect to the, to the First Nation um, is, is, uh, is unfortunate. And it's unfortunate that to this point we couldn't work together to get things moving forward quicker. The Parks Canada statement also says the federal agency recognizes that the discovery of ancestral remains during construction work has been very painful and distressing to members of the Red Rock Indian Band. We remain committed to the ongoing efforts to address the situation with the utmost respect and sensitivity. Jessica Clement, TBT News. City staff have narrowed it down to two possible sites for the proposed temporary village meant to address homelessness here in Thunder Bay. Council will discuss the sites, which are both on the south side at tonight's meeting. This comes as the Ontario big city mayors ask senior levels of government to review mandatory drug treatment laws. Vasilios Bellos reports. It's one of the city's most ambitious ideas to tackle the homeless crisis. Monday's City Council meeting will see staff discuss two possible sites for the proposed temporary village, with other municipalities like Peterborough already attempting the concept. The first is at Cam River Heritage Park, which would house 100 units and cost at least $5.9 million to become operational. Staff believe that option will create less community opposition. The other is at Miles Street East and would cost $4 million to get running, but house only 80 units. Regardless of which option is chosen, annual operating costs for the sites will be at least $1.5 million. City staff are in favor of the temporary village, saying the status quo doesn't offer enough indoor options to reduce encampments. This says the issue continues to worsen, as more and more people every summer are living outdoors in Thunder Bay. At this stage now, we've been trying darn near everything without much success. Discussions on the temporary village come as Ontario big city mayors are calling for a federal and provincial review of mandatory drug and mental health treatment laws, specifically for those who pose a risk to themselves or others. The motion passed by the mayors tied the issue to homelessness, with an estimated 1,400 encampments now present across the province. Thunder Bay Mayor Ken Boshkov says 
he doesn't know whether expanding mandatory treatment would be effective, but believes a review is necessary. I'm not a medical expert, but at, at this stage, we, uh, it's necessary that we try darn near every suggestion just to try and make some yards and, and make some progress because, as you can see, outside, uh, the problem seems to be growing. Boshkov was asked whether there were concerns that mandatory treatment would infringe on individual rights. The mayor says these issues take a toll on all city residents. People who may feel that rights are being infringed upon uh, also have to know that it's infringing upon people who really don't have a lot of money to spend on extra taxes to pay for the extra costs. People understand what the end goal is here, is to beat down addictions and to beat down the drug trafficking. Vicilios Balos, TBT News. It was a day filled with purple at City Hall, as local advocates and the recovery community held a protest to save the PATH 525 Consumption and Treatment Services site. People at the rally want council to join in with other Ontario cities and fight to protect the life-saving services. Riley Cohen reports. According to local advocates and the recovery community, someone loses their life to toxic drugs every two and a half hours in Ontario. Here in Thunder Bay, it is over three times the provincial average. They say consumption and treatment services sites play a vital role in preventing overdoses, particularly among the houseless population. Local advocates gathered at City Hall to stage a powerful die-in protest where they had 465 purple balloons to represent every reversed overdose at the Norwest Health Center's PATH 525 clinic since it opened. You know, when I see the balloons for the people of Live Saved, it also reminds me, it makes me think of the balloons of the people who weren't saved. And like it was said in one of the person's talks, like, this place closes, all of those people who were saved this year, I mean, where are they going to be? What is going to happen to them? And Another activity used to show the impact of not having consumption sites saw attendees drawing outlines of one another's bodies on the ground to represent the possibility of what may happen if there are no safe sites to go to in the city. Because there were so many people dying, and, and now we're seeing that happen again uh, with overdose and, and drug poisoning, right? And so um, the chalk and the dye-in was to represent uh, or be a physical representation of the lives lost uh, and hopefully a powerful uh, message that we're conveying. Miller, along with everyone else at the dye-in, are calling on Thunder Bay to follow the example of Kitchener and Waterloo in fighting the province to keep their safe consumption sites. McKellar Ward Councillor Brian Hamilton also spoke at the dye-in protest as an ally and advocate for the PATH 525 program and safe injection sites. Um, advocating for things for the province, we really have to be strategic with our asks. Um, you know, the, the province is our friend. Um, you know, maybe we have difference, difference of opinions on some things, but ultimately we have to work together. And uh, so, so there's some work to be done, to, in my opinion, but uh, I'm happy to look at the resolutions and, 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 uh, and push forward with the IGA committee and, and, and see, uh, see what they have to say about it. Miller hopes the fact that Hamilton was here means he will be an advocate for the PATH 525 program at City Council. Riley Cohen, TBT News. Police have arrested a man following an alleged stabbing this weekend in Webequay First Nation. Anishinaabeaski police were called about a serious assault early Saturday morning. The female victim was airlifted to hospital here in Thunder Bay. The extent of her injuries hasn't been released. 26-year-old Brighton Quissus of Webequay is charged with attempted murder and possession of a weapon. He appeared in bail court yesterday and remains in custody. MPPs returned to Queen's Park today after a 19-week break. The province made several announcements on day one of the legislative session, including the appointment of former federal Liberal Health Minister Jane Philpott. The move comes as parties prepare for the possibility of an early provincial election. CTV's Siobhan Morris reports. Hi, how are you? With more than 2.5 million Ontarians without a family doctor, the Ford government has hired a Liberal to help close the gap. 
Dr. Jane Philpott, former health minister to Justin Trudeau, will lead a team aiming to connect all Ontarians to primary care in the next five years. We are working very closely with Dr. Philpott. She has uh, ensured that the first 100 days are all going to be about where are the opportunities. Exactly how many more medical staff does Ontario need? Bill Potts government appointment, a blow to the Liberals. She was considering a political future. A potential star candidate dimmed in the run-up to a possible early election, but leader Bonnie Crombie insists. I'm delighted as long as the government commits to implementing and adhering to her recommendations. Something all opposition party leaders are skeptical of. The first government bill of this session focused on the roads, requiring provincial sign-off for new bike lanes, and the threat of pulling out existing ones, something the government would pay for. We've seen Toronto become one of the most congested cities in the entire world, uh, and this is really about a reasonable approach. Municipal leaders have called this an overreach. Taking those dedicated lanes away from bicyclists is going to make gridlock worse, and it's going to make our streets less safe. The bill also accelerates environmental studies and other measures to build Highway 413 attaching big fines for people who may try to block it. It's a very clear message uh, that uh, we will do anything and everything to get this highway built. Asked for a price tag for the 413 and a potential Highway 401 tunnel, the minister couldn't offer one. This is a government that is stuck in schemes and scandals at a time when people in this province are really struggling or, or frankly stuck. The NDP tried to find out in question period who's been interviewed by the Mounties as part of a criminal investigation into the Greenbelt land removal. The former Minister of Housing says, not him. I have not been contacted by uh, the RCMP. Uh, I remain committed uh, to cooperate with them as we move forward. Clark now serving as government house leader after giving up his cabinet post last September. That was CTV's Siobhan Morris. Local MPP Lise Vaujois also questioned the transportation minister today. Vaujois wants to see the new truck inspection station in Shunya open more often to help keep defective transport trucks and untrained drivers off area highways. The MTO says its strategy of sporadic operating hours at the station actually makes it harder for transport drivers to predict when they'll be inspected. But Vaujois doesn't buy it, blaming it on a lack of MTO inspectors instead. And there are only 28 people to staff inspection stations across all of Northern Ontario. The government has the power, the means and the responsibility to reduce the number of horrific accidents taking place on our highways. The solutions are staring us in the face. So what on earth is stopping the government from ending the carnage? We have made significant investments uh, in both frontline officers as well as facilities across the province, including one uh, just uh, outside that member's riding in Shunya, where we invested $30 million state-of-the-art uh, project to ensure that we keep uh, people uh, safe. And we will continue to work with our uh, partners at the OPP uh, and others across the industry to continue having the safest roads uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world, Mr. Speaker. Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP Kevin Holland says he's excited by the latest developments for the regional hospital's planned cardiovascular surgery unit. The hospital confirmed last week that the bid period to complete the expansion has closed and it's now reviewing the submissions. It's hoped the contract can be awarded in early 2025. The fundraiser for the project has already raised $20 million to date, and the province has been funding the planning phases. Holland says having these surgeries done close to home will eliminate some of the stress for patients needing cardiac care. To provide those services here closer to home for the Northwestern Ontario residents will alleviate a lot of that stress uh, and, and, and just make the overall uh, experience as, as better as possible. So yeah, this is huge. It's, it's something that uh, we've heard uh, for a long time that uh, service that was uh, requested or needed in, in Northwestern Ontario and uh, we're moving forward on that. The potential price tag of the project hasn't yet been revealed. Holland says it will be up to his government's Ministry of Health to review the chosen bid before deciding whether to greenlight the construction. It's an annual tradition that raises money and awareness for food security. 
The group Empty Bowls Caring Hearts hosted its 25th anniversary fundraising dinner last night. The event was shifted to the Confederation College cafeteria following the sudden closure of the Moose Hall last week. Emma Chilton reports. Empty Bowls Thunder Bay, an annual event that raises funds for Shelter House and the local food bank, hosted its 25th anniversary fundraising dinner on Sunday. The event is normally held at the Moose Hall, but with last-minute difficulties securing the location this year, Confederation College was happy to host the sold-out dinner with over 340 attendees. Robin Cooper, chair of Empty Bowls, emphasized that the event was essential as the funds raised play a crucial role in supporting organizations that give back to the community. And so it's very important that we keep this event going because unfortunately the need isn't going away. There's even more need. And the organizations that we support do a lot of good work in our community. So it was a bit of a shock when we found out we'd have to change venues last week, but the college was so accommodating. And as you can see behind me, everyone's here. They're having a great time. Everything is just going perfectly and we are, we couldn't be happier. Shelter House Executive Director Brendan Carlin says the fundraising event is incredibly beneficial for the organization and the perfect way to kick off such a charitable season. Kind of leading into um, the holiday time, which is when lots of uh, charities make their money essentially. There's a lot of donations that come and so having an event like this to kick off the season if you will uh, is really great for us. With the success of this year's dinner, Cooper is hoping to continue the partnership with Confederation College for the foreseeable future. And we've had some preliminary talks already and we also have some ideas about how we can get students more involved in this event too, which I think would be really important. Right from, you know, the culinary students making the soup to actually having students be here and, you know, get to be a part of the event as well. So we're going to work on that because I think it's a really positive partnership for the future. Emma Chilton, TBT News. Thunder Bay residents once again pulled out their roller skates this weekend as Goods & Co. hosted another Wheelies throwback event. It was called Hallow Wheelies and it brought out hundreds of people to show off their roller skating skills and their best costumes, of course. Jessica Clement has the story. After popular demand, Goods & Co. was once again transformed into a roller rink on Saturday night, this time for a Halloween dance party. <laughs> Hollow Wheelies saw around 200 attendees, with many of them showing off their costumes. And the DJ kept the party going throughout the night by playing some Halloween tunes. Goods & Co. events manager Kayla Wallace says, with the success of the last Wheelies throwback event, they had to host another one. Last time we had about, I would say, 170 to 200 guests throughout the duration of the evening and the response was people wanted us to host it once a month. So doing the second one now as the weather starts to cool down, people are looking for more inside activities. Um, we're seeing the same response again and hopefully people want to do it throughout the rest of the year. Prizes were given away throughout the night for different categories including best costume and nicest moves. We spoke to a number of attendees who gave the event a solid 10 out of 10. I think it's really fun because uh, you get to be active and go roller skating and then you can come here with friends. Part of socializing and having fun and just being a part of a community and that's what we used to do. We used to be part of a community. All of us friends used to just go together and just have so much fun. That's what this is all about. It's fun. I would probably come back because, well, I just get to have fun and it's like a big space that I could go to and uh, yeah it's just really fun. Yeah and it's just to like let out some good vibes and have and a chance to hang out with all your friends. Wallace tells residents to keep their eyes on Goods & Co's social media pages as there will be more roller rink events to come. We like to keep the dates under wraps, of course, um, but definitely it's something that we're looking to do throughout the year, and it's all going to be based on, on the response of the guests, and it's turning out to be a pretty good one. Happy Halloween! Jessica Clement, TBT News.